You're listening to Film Seizure. This is Jeff. And this is Jason. And you can catch us on Wednesdays weekly talking about some new, some sort of movie. Yeah. (laughs) You can also find us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Just search for Film Seizure. And uh, as Jason said, check us out each week. Yes. Your Wednesdays should be less crappy because of us, we hope. (laughs) Maybe. Or more crappy. Or more crappy. Who knows? Either which way. Wednesdays are always a crap shoot. Why not give us a try? Exactly. (laughs) Can't say it any better than that. (laughs) What I saw wasn't human. Oh, my God. (laughs) He was very tall. What's more, it saw me, this thing. Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Film Seizure. This is Jeff Arbuckle. This is Jason Oliver. And uh, this is the beginning of uh, Clive Barker Month. Yeah. May is uh, Clive Barker Month. It's been declared. But sure. Yes. Make it's, it so. Make it, make it so. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, five weeks in May, uh, five Wednesdays in May. Five Wednesdays in May of all Barker. Yes. Yeah. And um, uh, we're kicking off uh, this week. Yeah, we're kicking off this week with uh, Rawhead Rex. Um, Not the earliest Barker film, but pretty darn close, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, But also, I think what we're doing here is we're, you would expect us to talk about probably Hellraiser, right? If we're doing Clive Barker, and I don't think we're going to touch Hellraiser or Hellraiser 2 quite yet. No, we're going to put that in our back pocket for right now. Yeah, so we're going to kind of dive into um, maybe a little, it's hard to say lesser known Barker, because... There's a little bit of that, but um, but some maybe underwatched Barker, or maybe not the Barker that would come straight to mind, unless you were a, a pretty big fan, which I know there are lots of you out there who who really like Clive Barker. So um, forgive us for p- maybe some of our ignorance coming in. We're we're probably not on your level as far as uh, as some of our knowledge of you know the novels and the story, no. short stories and things go. But we're kind of t- taking the movies as we appreciate them and, and talking about them. and Yeah, I just want to watch monster movies. Yeah, man. yeah, that's what it really <laughs> is. And, and, and Barker's got r- really interesting monster-type movies. They, they, well, and I think also you can say oftentimes the monsters are people, not just not just monsters, but right. there is a monster angle inside even the the heroic people. Yeah, there's, the, there's different forms of monsters and mm-hmm. kind of like different kind of uh opposing monsters even right and yeah the true monster may not be the one who's the most grotesque uh the true monster might be the one that looks like you and me and i think that's what's really interesting about how barker really approaches horror yeah and so uh so yeah so we're we're kicking off the month this week with uh rawhead rex uh some of the other things that we've got that we'll talk about uh are uh, candy man lord of illusions mm-hmm. Uh, what's the the midnight? What's that one? The midnight Meat Train. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> that's that's based on a sh- a short story uh, in the Books of Blood by Barker, um, of the same name, I believe. I've never seen it. I know it's got Bradley Cooper. And, yeah, there's um, some people in it, and um, it's got what's his face from Snatch and Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Uh, uh, Vinnie Jones. Vinnie Jones. Yeah, yeah he's in it. Um, I'm really looking forward to that one because I don't know much about it. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, so some of that is we're going to be coming at new, and there's actually one movie that we'll talk about uh, later in the month, probably towards the end, uh, that is especially uh, important to Jason Yeah, that I don't know that much about. Uh, So we'll we'll talk about Nightbreed. Yes, we'll talk about Nightbreed. That's the one that um, I probably have the largest connection to and I'll I'll get into more of that when sure. we when we do the episode but but that's kind of a, a an interesting one to cover too because really there's three versions of that movie so 
we haven't even totally decided how we're going to approach that one yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I think probably we'll go with the Cabal Cut because I think that um, that is the most fascinating version of the movie, if if maybe it's not the best version of the movie. And that's something that we'll discuss. Yeah, and uh, you know, and it, it certainly sounds fancy, the Cabal Cut. The Cabal Cut, yeah. right. Um, it's a fan cut. So that so. makes it really interesting. Like it's, it sort of flies in the face of the theatrical studio cut and of the director's cut that came out a few years ago. Yeah, fans are assholes. Yeah, they are. I, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, maybe someday I'll. Uh, maybe maybe you'll you'll have already heard, or maybe someday I will express my feelings towards fandom in general. Um, <laughs> it's it's getting frustrating these days, but. That, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about Mr. Rex himself, yeah, Rawhead Rex. Rawhead Rex. Yeah, Woo. so he is a bitchin' monster. He is quite the thing of monstrosity. <laughs> a monstrosity. Monstrosity. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, um, so a little bit of background that I have on Rawhead Rex. Um, this is something that uh, I've recently, I mean, as we're recording this, this, this was relatively recent. Uh, news, but there was a uh, there's a channel on Roku that I would watch endlessly, and a lot of the movies that I've written about on bmovieinema.com and uh, stuff that we've talked that we're going to talk about here, yeah. I actually saw on that Roku channel. It's uh, Bizarre TV, and uh, the the person who ran the the channel uh, as we're recording this just recently passed away, and. Um, so uh, Rawhead Rex was one of the very first movies that I watched in its entirety on Bizarre TV when I downloaded it from when I got my Roku in October of 2015, something like that. And so, I mean, it was one of those things. It's like, man, what is this? This feels like a Clive Barker thing. There's yeah. there's kind of douchebaggy people in it. And it's like, hmm, <laughs> feels like a Clive Barker movie. Sure enough, it was a Clive Barker movie. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's like when, uh, when Jason got this uh, on Blu-ray and we were talking about wanting to do some Barker movies, it's like when he got over here today uh, to do our recording, I was like, that's the one I want to start with. That's the one I want to watch first. Yeah, and I think that was a perfect choice because it is it is almost the earliest version of a Clyde Barker movie you can get. I mean, there's one before it. It's Transmutations, also known as Underworld, that was a collaboration, the first collaboration between um, George Pavlow and... Um, and Clive Barker, which yeah, it, it's I don't think there's any release of that that's not gray market. Um, I don't know if there's even a good looking should... print of it anywhere. I, I think you can watch it on YouTube, and um, from from everything I've heard, it's not the best. Uh, but it, it it has a video cover that I remember. Yeah, you know. absolutely. And it it was I guess Clive Barker was kind of approached to to write something for the screen. He was kind of break, wanting to break into the movie biz and um that seemed like a good opportunity but the the whole movie itself i think was sold to its producers as more of like a like a rock video and not so much a horror film and Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. barker was a little distressed by the finished product he said they took all the horror out of it but what's interesting about transmutations aka underworld a couple things really first thing is i think it's the first example of what well, is the first example of of movie Barker introducing the concept of monsters as the good guys, right? Mm. Which we'll talk mm-hmm. a lot about mm-hmm. when we talk about Nightbreed. Yeah, and I, there is an element here, even though yeah. Rawhead Rex is most certainly a villain. There is a certain element of that that exists here from a certain point of view. Sure, um, but uh, no, um, yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, I think that. Uh, because I think this is just one year prior to Hellraiser. Yeah, so so this one kind of came out, right, where it was like, well, I didn't really like Transmutations, as Barker was saying, but we'll give it another go. And this one, I think, um, he was a little more ha- happy with the result. It was horrific. It was his script. Um, it was probably closer to, to what he envisioned on the screen. But I don't know that um, Clive really cared much for George as a director. I don't think that I mean, his this, sensibilities were, were... Yeah. I mean, because... He wanted I, to be a horror director, but he's not much of a horror director. Right. Like, yeah. I think that there's... This movie is not spectacular. No, it's But really it not. is 
fun to watch. Yep. And it's got some good things in it. Yeah. Um, and I think that this shows a certain to a certain extent like what what Clive Barker brought to yeah. the storytelling and to nightmarish type of scenarios. Um, and it could been, you know, it could be a situation where if it if it had the right writer or the I'm the sorry, right the right director yeah. rather, then would it have been just a little bit better or a little bit, you know, something closer to what we would see later from Clive Barker. Well, I think the problem I had with this movie is there's a, there's a total lack of tone. Like there's, there's nothing really creepy about this movie other than it's a monster, right? Yeah. There's no real sense of foreboding or, um, or dread. There's no real like ratcheting up of the suspense and tension. Uh, a lot of that's on the director, in my opinion. It, it, he just didn't understand how to present the material, even though <laughs> somehow some way he really was attracted to this type of material he didn't know how to produce it yeah i think that you can say also it's like the characters are interesting the the characters are actually pretty well uh fleshed out i mean sure uh they each character is unique and distinct interesting in their own right um and uh, but yeah there's something that there is a little bit of a maybe almost a je ne sais quoi that's missing, mm. you know, that, that, that Hellraiser brings home or Absolutely. Lord of Illusions or Candyman brings home. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, um, yeah, I mean, so this is a pretty basic movie. I think, you know, you've got a situation where you've got the small Irish town, um, and I'm about to say something really stupid and, and forgive me, but <laughs> Clive Barker's British, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, cause I, I know that, you know, like, uh, cause Hellraiser is a, is a Brit is in Britain. Yeah. But anyway, so, uh, this is a small Irish town. Um, it starts off by these, uh, you see kind of the setting of the town, which is you've got a, a, a small church, uh, and the prisoners are all townspeople, a little bit older, um, it's almost like a, you can almost say it's a, like a dying town. It's like people are getting older. Um, there's not too many young people in the town anymore. No, not much at all. Um, and it seems like all the young people that are in town live in the trailer park. So, so <laughs> which they may just be passerby. So, so yeah. either that or there's just, there's not much of a future. Right. For this town. Um, but uh, you do see uh, a group of guys, three guys are trying to clear out a field uh -huh. and they're trying to take down these uh, stone obelisks or yeah, something yeah like pillars pillars and they're just sticking out of the ground um and um a, the one guy a couple of his buddies are like you know <laughs> let's go to the pub and get fucking wasted i can assume they're irish right. um i mean that's zing, what i'd rather do <laughs> irish, <laughs> irish zing number one already yeah. ticked off for me there's <laughs> a lot of there's a lot of good drinking in this movie actually <laughs> oh smittix and yeah, yeah Smittics fantastic and there's a scene where um rawhead rex is like tipping over this this uh, trailer, and there's this old drunken Irishman in there, and he's doing everything <laughs> he can to keep his beer from spilling, which yeah, is which is fantastic. exactly how I would probably react in that situation. Well, you you I've seen you do you've it. You've seen me do it. Yeah. I, I, I've fallen on my face <laughs> before I would spill a beer. Yeah, I've seen you do it. Yeah. Um. So um. <laughs> save my beer. Um, <laughs> the the um. Uh, so uh, the the guy's two buddies leave and basically leave this guy to take care of this obelisk himself and he um uh he eventually does like loosen it and a uh, lightning lightning strikes it or something because they're like a storm that's coming there's there's some mention made to like a rainstorm uh as it's happening and before it's rolling in and everything and uh out from the ground barely covered comes a fucking behemoth monster yeah. thing yeah and you know he's got like this long, almost horse head like look, and he's got these teeth. Yeah, and he's it's almost, like, almost like a boar's mouth, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it is meant to be more yeah. like a swine of yeah. some sort. Yeah, like a yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so he comes out. He just immediately kills the dude that's th that was left there, um, and then he starts rampaging. And yeah. that is literally the movie. That's the movie. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 he's indiscriminately killing anything in its path. He doesn't seem to really hunt. He just seems to, if you're around, you're going to get killed. 
You're gonna get you're gonna get your cap imitated. Yeah, he likes he's really really into clawing your skin off, um, hanging you upside down, carrying cut, around your head, and cu- then cutting off your head and carrying it around. Yeah, yeah that's um, that's the modus operandi. Now, um, so I mean, really, at this point, it's like you have what I I think called during the movie accidental horror. Yeah. You know, you just have these people who are in the way of this monster that nobody has done anything wrong. They just moved the wrong thing, yeah. and now the whole town is fucked, you know, basically. So it's it's kind of that interesting type of horror movie that happens from time to time, which I usually tend to call it a little bit more cruel type of horror, sure. where you have people who are not deserving of the fates that they receive. Um, just because one guy did something wrong, the whole the whole town is fucked, You're basically. Right. Um, Which is kind of can be a very invigorating kind of invigorating kind of horror as well because mm-hmm. it's it's indiscriminate. It's well, it's it's the idea of there is no there is no virtue necessarily. Right. It's just it's hey, sorry, but your town has this yeah. secret. Which which in a lot of ways could just be really really scary. Like that yeah. in and of itself could be scary. Well, I, mean, I, I, I feel like the the problem with this movie though is it never really ever feels scary. No, it really isn't. It's just it's just a lot of gore and hey, that guy just got his ass handed to him, yeah. you know, or whatever. But um, no, so there is a uh, a family that is in. Uh, this is a weird part. I always, I every time I've watched this movie, I've always thought this is a weird element. But uh, there's an American guy who is with his family in this Irish countryside, and he's there to take pictures. He's a historian of some sort. And he's there to uh, take pictures, and uh, uh, he he visits this church. He wants to he, like he takes pictures of these stained glass windows, which we'll talk about here in a minute. He wants to look at the history of the of the parish, like he wants to, all the records. That it seems awkward that somebody just walks into town from another country and asks for your records of your parish. Yeah, you know, that's that's a little. He's weird. got some sort of like thesis angle that he's yeah. writing about um, with like. I don't know ancient. I think it's I think it's the rise of uh, of like Western. It, 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 my, my this may be just fanfic. I don't know. But <laughs> my my impression was he is studying the rise of Western religion in a Druid or pagan in a pagan yeah origin, origin. or something right yeah, yeah because because and that's actually. Because of, he does say later he does not believe in the devil. Right. So he, he is coming at it from an, uh, uh, a, um, I don't know, he, he's not, he's not a, I don't think he's a, he's a, uh, an atheist. It seems like he's almost agnostic yeah, about he's, it. Yeah, he's kind of got an agnostic sensibility. Um, and that's kind of where, where you start to see some of the actual theme of the movie come out and early in the movie i made a comment i was like so this is basically monster is is resurrected inadvertently monster terrorizes town monster gets destroyed right is that the movie we're watching it's just like yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much that's it. it was like so so there's no subtext to this movie and it didn't seem like there was at first but there's a little bit there and it's yeah, I think a little bit of that Clive Barker comes that's through. That's exactly what it is. Like it's almost it almost comes through in spite of itself. Yeah. Like like <laughs> yeah, like the director did the di- everything yeah. to, to fumble it. The director but it still happened. The director didn't really seem to get it. He just wanted to direct a horror like a monster movie, right? He didn't yeah. he didn't really come at it to, with a, a unique approach, but yet some of that that those thematic elements that you see in Barker's works definitely start to come through. As mm-hmm. you watch this movie, yeah, because uh, one of the very first things that happens is once Rawhead Rex is resurrected, uh, there is uh, Declan O'Brien, which uh, we were still trying to figure out. It's like, is Declan his name or is that a title? We we don't know. I we mean, figured sorry. it out. It's like it's like an Anglican title, I guess. Of some yeah, sort. something Declan. like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's some. We we thought maybe because it seemed like he had another name also, but um, but he was not the head honcho of the church. That guy is Reverend Coot. Reverend Coot. Like Coot. Coot. Actually, make a. That's like a weird. Like, am I pronouncing that right? Coot. Yeah. Coot? It, it, yeah. <laughs> David Dukes, who stars in this movie, who's been in several things we've seen, which is yeah. interesting because, like, I've always heard that name, but I think Jason explained why I <laughs> recognize yeah. that name. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I've seen him in several things, and and he he comes in and he's like, you know, trying to make friends with Declan O'Brien, and he's like. 
uh, so Coot, uh, he wouldn't by chance be an older fellow, would he? You know, and he's trying to be like, you know, kind of, ha ha ha, you know, kind of, like, kind of being your pal, you know. Yeah, which yeah. is, I think that does come from the script. I think that is definitely uh, David Duke understood that his character had that sense of humor or something, yeah. um, and I think that's a Clive Barker thing. Uh, but uh, he uh, and so Declan O'Brien's like not having it like immediately is like very standoffish. Yeah. There's at one point he is kind of making eyes at a parishioner during the service at the very beginning. And he's just kind of a scumbag. Yeah. You get the sense that his he's already kind of vulnerable to temptation. Yeah. And then apparently once Rawhead Rex has been resurrected it activates something in this church that this church you find out it, it predates um, Christ yeah. or at least the, the, or at the least land the, that it was built on or yeah. a structure that was built on this land bef- predates Christ and um, and there's some pagan history behind it and it's connected in a very physical and metaphysical way to Rawhead and Declan O'Brien is is sort of transformed by this energy yeah. and by by touching the altar and he becomes corrupted by yep. by this sort of demonic energy yeah and so he um and then once he becomes corrupted it he that guy who plays that character is fucking amazing oh yeah his like he starts like just he he drops like i think he drops like 12 f-bombs throughout the rest of the movie he's like fuck you fuck this well, fuck did, out of here what did you the- say it's it's like it's like when a when a child first learns that like uh cuss words have power yeah and they just and, can't stop saying them <laughs> and, and they say them in, in all sorts of inappropriate ways yeah. and and, and uh, just dropping reasons. them in everywhere yeah, you everywhere. know and like, so this fucking cereal is great mom <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. So, you know, so like he becomes corrupted and he kind of becomes like a follower of Rawhead Rex. And, um, you know, so Rawhead Rex just starts kind of just shambling through a town. It's almost like, it's almost like a, like a Godzilla movie yeah, where it's like yeah. he's awoken and he just starts rumbling through, you know, and it's mm-hmm. like, he's, he's a force of nature at that point. Um, and then, uh, the, so the, 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 the American guy, uh, uh, he's, you know, he's like taking pictures of the church. He he realizes that one of the stained glass windows has like a fucking monster face on it. Yeah. Uh, like showing a monster being defeated. And I think he initially thinks that's just a representation of like the devil, the devil. or something. It turns out it is actually Rawhead Rex. Um, and uh, so Rawhead Rex comes like through this uh, this little trailer park, like where people have like, taken like not like a trail like a trailer park like you think of but like a like a camping trailer. like a camp trailers yeah. yeah and there's like a whole little community of these little campers and um rawhead rex comes through and he's like you know uh he's already killed one guy and he's kind of dragging his body through which was i thought was kind of cool yeah um before he like found the tree to hang it from and there's like this young couple like making out and stuff and they they get you know, they see Rawhead Rex in the in the woods, and you know that guy gets decapitated, and um, and so the the writer, the American guy, is um, you know kind of sees Rawhead Rex standing on top of this hill with the guy's head, yeah, uh, and uh, he's like, "Fuck, what is that?" You know, like he he he's he never thinks once that his eyes are playing tricks on him. Like it's like he sees that and he like. That's a fucking monster, you know, and, and so it's um, in the long run. Uh, his son ends up getting killed by his. I mean, like his ten-year-old son gets eaten by Rawhead Rex. Like yeah. they, they don't pull any punches in this fucking movie. Um, and uh, the guy now becomes vengeful, again, you know, trying to get the police to help. Yeah, well, he's pretty angry because he had already reported what he saw to the police. And the police didn't believe him about seeing this monster. <laughs> well, and, and this scene was really kind of ridiculous because it, it's one of those pet peeves that I have. That's a cliche scene in a horror movie where the person comes into the the police station sort of hysterical about this 
inexplicable thing, this impossible thing that they've seen, <laughs> and and they're discounted as a kook, right? But, but and, and, every, and, every, and every time they come in way too hot. They yeah, come, they, they give no in, like, reason to believe that he's a, they a start, competent person. They start with the crazy, and they don't work <laughs> – up to the crazy so so this was maybe a little bit more measured of that of an approach but still he didn't talk about who he was what he was in town for his what, he had, what the, he had seen at the at the church like like he hadn't really uh he didn't come at this in a very rational way he he said the of course the obligatory i know how this how this sounds but every crazy person telling a crazy story says that yeah so again so that there it devolves a little bit into cliche but it's it gives the story an opportunity for these investigators to start to put two and two together and realize that there are other witnesses who are seeing the same thing. And there's there's piles of dead bodies. Yeah, which, we are dealing with a monster. Which actually kind of comes with probably the best scene in the movie, which now Rawhead Rex has come into this trailer park. Yeah. And, like, there's witnesses everywhere now. Yeah. You know, and it's like he's just, like, slashing people left and right. He's knocking over trailers. Uh, he's keeping people from, um, uh, or he's, he's, you know, he's he's making it tough for old drunkards to keep their to keep their beers, their beers. Uh, yeah. from spilling. Yeah, yeah. So, and, so yeah, this this is like that. Everything is out in the open. Yeah, and that's a great scene. Usually, it's just, usually scenes like that in horror movies are are a breath of fresh air for me. They're a, it's a relief. Yeah, because you're not now. You're no longer dealing with this kind of he said she said disbelief of of what you're dealing with like that gets right. really boring yeah for me. And, and oftentimes you have like that very same thing where it's like oh you're just crazy you're not seeing and then it right. takes the the guy being confronted and usually that guy gets killed yeah right away it's you know when you kind of get it all out in the open and hey this is the this is the the monster and everybody understands what page they're on i'm like oh my god yes now we can finally start to tell a story yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's honestly the turning point in this movie. Yeah. Um, because once that comes out, because like, OK, so the guy uh, is already vengeful about wanting to, uh, you know, avenge his son's uh, being eaten and probably decapitated. Uh, I'm assuming Rawhead yeah. decapitates he, he everyone. Decapitates, decapitates everyone. Yeah. Um, but he likes so, carrying heads around. <laughs> yeah. Um, he is, uh, you, you know, so it's like he starts to put two and two together and that's when you start getting into the religious angle of this movie you know where we find out it's like there is an entire rich history of this ground of this place of the things that people used to believe in that's just buried in the catacombs under the 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 little church yeah that the that even the reverend coot didn't know anything about i mean we've built on history of history right i mean it's and, it, and what's interesting is every layer of dirt is an evolution of that different type yeah. of fear, right? Right. And I think that, like, you know, because it also, like, it had something to do with how Rawhead Rex came into being because there's, like, actually, like, a legit, like, thousands old, like, blueprint of how Rawhead Rex came to be. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, you get this idea that's like, oh, you know, and, and the crazy uh, Declan guy, he's... Um, now he's like a raving, you know, stark raving mad lunatic zealot of Rawhead Rex. And he says, you know, it's like, this is truly God. Yeah. He, you know, he doesn't say that, that rationally. He exclaims it. Yeah. It's like Rawhead Rex it. is God right, because he exists. He in is God. Yeah. yeah. Which immediately, this is where I, this movie got really cool for me. Um, because this is a very clear example of, I think, an early character archetype of Barker's, mm-hmm. where it's the it is the, um, the 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 priestly character, the religious character, who is easily turned from his faith, or yeah. or is has been in some sort of denial of of god of the devil or over whatever it might be and is shown a side of this belief system that kind of makes something real for him yeah but maybe not in the good side of things more on the bad side of things. right it's like you know so that's where i kind of say that there is even a little bit of point of view kind of 
uh, uh, element here where it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say it's like, yeah, if Rawhead Rex was first before any other kind of belief in God or Jesus or whatever, it's like, yeah, I mean, he is a deity, which could be, I mean, he did spare a pregnant woman, right? Which is interesting that he had some and, and sense of. And that didn't of, quite go anywhere. No, it which didn't go was anywhere. Interesting either. Yeah, I don't no, know. No, he he did not kill one kid who saw him, but killed, but the, killed the, the author's son. Yeah. He did not kill a pregnant woman because he sensed that she was pregnant or saw that she was pregnant. One or the other. Right. And that that was weird. But he has some sense of some people he kills, some people he turns into followers uh -huh. you know and it's like it's it's just kind of weird but well, uh, but there the is a thing. sense I, that he he does have a sense of well that is a deity and yeah he's a monster but it's a deity also it's here's like, here's something that that's interesting about the pregnant woman after he spares her life and then she's discovered um with her dead husband mutilated dead husband she actually kind of looks like she has been put under his influence yeah, a little bit yeah like she's maniacal to a sense but she also looks like she's kind of become possessed in a way it's almost like yeah like some of the possession right yeah it's like it turns out that she just turns out to be in shock sure much like the the child that he didn't kill um that was i think the brother of of the guy he did kill or something, you know, like of the, of the older teenager that he killed. Um, he was, uh, he wasn't, I mean, it was more of a shock sort of thing for the other people who switched their faith or became zealots or whatever. They were almost like almost, uh, they, there was an influential part, but there was also a weakness to them or some sort of, I don't know. It, it was weird because it's like, um, in some ways it was in in some ways it was kind of like fracturing the uh the the reality of what they always believed in you know or whatever sure, it's, yeah in, in a way it kind of felt a little bit like in the mouth of madness yeah um where oh no you think you know what what you know what the what the god is or but no we're going to show you something well, even this terrible is, this is a, this is a theme that barker comes back to time and time again it's a theme in the hellraiser movies it's a theme in Nightbreed. Um, I mean, Father Ashbury in Nightbreed is basically his early representation of that character is is Declan O'Brien, mm. um, this this priest in Nightbreed who is who's an alcoholic, who's lost his faith. He's been broken um, probably twenty different ways, yeah. and he uh, he's a priest in name only at this point. Mm. And then he sees something. He sees this evidence of something else this this battle between good and evil but what he ends up being drawn toward more is ends up being the more the more evil power and he isn't even aware necessarily that it's evil he just he just sees it as what he would imagine a godlike power would be hmm. right mm -hmm. so he he in, in, in ends up kind of wanting to hunt the nightbreed who are monsters but who in reality are just trying to to follow a very strict moral code and be left alone, right? So there's so much ambiguity in how Barker approaches the even the the, the black and white concept of good versus evil. Yeah. Like to Barker, there there is no real black and white. That's where I kind of got a little confused by the concept of Rawhead Rex. Is is this what is this? You know, is this evil? Is this? Yeah, because they don't even explain why he ended up getting buried. Who buried him? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, because it's a, is it something that existed that was that was worshipped by pagans or by druids or whatever? And then when the when the Christians came in, did they try to kill it or get rid of it? Was he? Could it have been that? there was more benevolence yeah has it mutated in some yeah way? or yeah, yeah it, it is was his defeat the reason why he just goes around and kills everybody is it a now? guardian of some sort yeah right like is it is it is its whole purpose to protect something yeah i mean you don't get a real good sense of it and i think that's part of where this movie is a little flawed right 
is it is is like it, it's a Godzilla movie, right? But even in a Godzilla movie, you get the sense that Godzilla is. I don't know. You would know better than I, but you get the sense that Godzilla it doesn't really want to destroy indiscriminately. He's just kind of been a little fucked over. Yeah, I mean, he, <laughs> he, he wants did, to get back to normalcy. Right, like, there there have been movies where he was just simply, the earliest movies that he was just simply a monster created by uh, the evils of man, you know, the, the creation of, of the atomic weapon. Sure, yeah, that's probably um, the purest metaphor for him, right? Yeah, but later, he be, when that was no longer... I mean, remember that the first Godzilla movie was nine years after the the bombs, right? You know, and well, well, so yeah, sure. And it's it's actually interesting. And I'm going to throw this into the ring real quick. But um, Twin Peaks season three, another thing that I love, if you don't know, dear listeners, is Twin Peaks. Is it, it kind <laughs> of takes a very similar approach to the evil of that universe. Is it's sort of created by the evil of man and right. the atomic bomb which i know is sort of the the first godzilla was kind of a, a reaction to this new terror yeah of, it's a uh, nuclear holocaust yeah so it was a um, yeah because the 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 final words of the movie and and at, which is funny because the japanese hits the point on the head of saying you know, if we do not learn how to stop destroying ourselves, we will create something that will destroy us, destroy yeah. us essentially. Yeah. And uh, the American movie changes that entirely. What, what did they change it to? I don't remember, but it's, I mean, there is a stark difference huh. between the Japanese and the American versions as to what the moral the of moral the story is. The moral message, yeah. wow. Um, and so, yeah, because later, in the later movies and in the, in the new movie, uh, the new series, rather the the American series, rather uh, Godzilla is seen as a force of nature. It wasn't it, it, the nuclear bomb awoke it, not created. Not created it. Uh, I don't it, like that as much. Well, it, there isn't. In, there are some of the Japanese movies made in the nineties or early two thousands. I can't remember which series it came into, but um, where. They it, these were the ideas of what deities were because they were earth, cre- they were created by the earth. It was you had Godzilla, uh, Ghidra, Mothra, and Baragon. They they all represented something else so of it's nature. Kinda, so it's a little bit of a metaphor for kind of burying the gods of the old and creating the new gods. It's it's kind of very Neil Gaiman actually. Almost yeah. yeah, because it's it's almost because when they were awoken they have no concept of what your what you've moved on from you know so it's like yeah. they're they're just continuing their ages old battle you know they yeah. they don't uh but you know but godzilla is also seen as a superhero too when they realized that kids flocked to it uh in the 60s he became well godzilla, a superhero. godzilla has become what he's needed to become for the audiences. for what exactly right and uh, that's why i was so happy with the american godzilla uh a few years back was that they made him actually a good guy yeah um because i grew up with him being a good guy being a hero and yeah he i mean he, he fucked up san francisco but he also <laughs> saved the whole planet from being taken over by those things you know right so you know it's like i like that idea uh-huh. you know and but uh, but he is exactly he is created to be whatever he, and so but there is a Kind of to get back around to the Clive Barker, there is a a deity angle to that absolutely. as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and so, you know, is that? I mean, yeah, this is this terrible monster, but is it guarding something? Is it doing something that it's not? It's not good or bad in the in the concept that we give it. You know, and so that I would have loved to have seen that from. I mean, like, yeah, in a way, they're just making a cheap monster movie. Yeah, really, but. It would have been so much cooler if, if Rawhead Rex was like a, oh no this this is you know he was a protector of this place, but when you know like when the the Catholics or the Christians or whatever came in and took over they saw it as a monster as a as a um, abomination and they buried it a devil a devil yeah and uh, you know and they they created the image of the devil from him right but then decided we can't we can't have this we got to get rid of it and then that's what made him angry yeah and so he just takes it out on everybody because he's see, that, been wrong see, that's we just rewrote a, that's the movie that's just that's an interesting movie right and i and, and i part of me believes that that's probably what Clive Barker was driving at in some way 
but when you're writing a script for for a studio that's really just interested in making a quick money grab monster movie um you do lose probably a lot of that in in the process and yeah probably. And, it's, and it's probably and it, honestly from what i've heard the whole the whole reason why barker was so insistent on directing hellraiser was because of his experience with rawhead rex i don't think that it was truly reflective of his vision even though he would probably be the first to admit that it was also written as just kind of like a hey i need to get my feet wet in this thing well i think and yeah because uh, i think frank miller's experience with with RoboCop was the same thing. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, you know, which which drove him away for a long time. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So I mean, it would have been. I mean, like, this is not based on anything he had ever written before. No, uh, it's an yeah. original script. I believe yeah. that. I believe that maybe Transmutations was based on a story of his, but this was an original script. Yeah. Yeah. I I would have wondered if you know if if he would have had a different, like if he would have had a short story or something he probably would have gotten into how it, even if rawhead rex was still a villain or a devil of some sort he could still be a vengeful deity as opposed to you know the idea of a loving peaceful god I you know and to... they could have still had that where he was still a worshiped thing by the people but yeah i don't know I what would I find? What I need to do at some point, and I, I kind of wish I had done this already for the sake of our listeners, is is read the um, the Rawhead Rex crossovers with the old Nightbreed comic, because I think that it's clear, it clearly was not lost on some people that Rawhead Rex had a connection to to Nightbreed in theme, in um, storytelling, in universe, right? Um, because it was enough so that. The, the Nightbreed movie spawned a comic which told a very straightforward retelling of the movie script and then expanded the universe from there. And it told, you know, quite a, f- a couple years of story um, beyond the movie. And part of that story incorporated the Rawhead Rex demon and uh, in an adversus kind of context it was nightbreed versus rawhead rex i believe and it was maybe a four or five issue run um so there's something else there in this whole barker universe Mm -hmm. where it it fits some piece of the puzzle uh, and that people are yeah are, are fascinated enough by to to i guess tell more story yeah i mean because there it certainly felt like you know, maybe this was something he had an idea of for like a short story, and he just said, "I'll just turn it into a script, and we'll just make a cheap little yeah. monster movie." You know, and maybe have some cool things in it or some ideas in there. But the idea is, eh, we'll just make a monster movie. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I don't know. I keep coming back to this, but from what I know of <clears throat> Transmutations, aka Underworld, and now having seen Rawhead Rex again, it's super clear to me that those two movies combined equal what he was trying to do with Nightbreed and make this monster movie where the monsters are the good guys, you know, make it action packed, fantasy filled. I mean, he, he was on record that he said he wanted to be the, the star Wars of monster movies, right? <laughs> Nightbreed. Um, it's a very, very lofty ambition. Um, and it didn't work, but I don't think it worked because of Barker. I think it worked because the studios, the people, the money men didn't get it. Um, so I think it was really a good choice for us to start with Rawhead Rex. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you can see the the Barker coda mm-hmm. start to really form itself in the in, in what he does um, in the medium of film. Yeah, I think so. And um you know, the I will say though, it's like it, it, Clive Barker always has something totally fucked up that you see in a movie. And we saw it today, maybe one you I you said it, it was one of the weirdest things you've ever seen in a movie. Yeah. Um so uh okay, so Rawhead Rex is 
And I think now I kind of understand that from where Rawhead Rex was buried, the path that he that he takes ultimately takes him to the church. Yes. It's almost like he's drawn to it. Yep. And uh, so he gets to the church, and, and Declan O'Brien is there, and he's like, you know, it's like he's his, his kooky follower and everything. And, uh, at one point, Reverend Coot is, like, discovering it's like, oh, my God, everything has gone fucking bonkers here. Everything is insane. He goes outside and sees uh, O'Brien, like, kneeling in front of Rawhead Rex. <laughs> yes. And Rawhead Rex uh, baptizes uh, uh, O'Brien by legit pissing on him. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it looks It is, it is a up. horse stream of piss. Yeah. And, it like, it's yellow. Yeah. It's And it's just right on the guy's face. Yeah. You know, and it's like... <laughs> And, you know, it's like, and, I mean, and the actor even looks like he's like holding, you know, like, like you would see a guy standing at the urinal, you yeah. know, like holding his, his junk, you know, and he's like just pissing just right on O'Brien's face. And O'Brien's like, ah, like bathing in it, you know, yeah. it's so fucking weird. Like, it's really weird. Clive Barker, man, he is some weird shit. We're going to see more weird shit today. And we're going to talk about more weird shit this month for sure. But Th- that was the one that's, of the weirdest things you'll ever see in a mainstream that's movie. Pure Barker weird. Yeah, yeah. that it, it's almost like a, a Barker clearly has a has a connection to bodily fluids as as sort of a medium for for I don't know. It's hard to describe. Like mostly, it's usually blood. Like blood symbolizes a lot to Barker. Yeah. But I think bodily fluids in general. Well, I, in, in some ways, it's like and a transference of such. Yeah, means a. It, it, it's something that Barker uses to tell and make <laughs> points about, like the transference of, I don't know. I want to say belief in some ways. Could be belief. It could just be the. I don't know. I mean, like in some ways, I think of it as like, life in general is kind of gross. Yeah. You know, it's like it's it's uh, and. I mean, it doesn't quite go. It's not body horror necessarily. No, like, like um, but it's in like the same Cronenberg. kind of vein. <coughs> yeah, I it don't know. It reminds me of 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 Candyman in some ways. Like, be my victim, right? And we'll talk about that one. But it's it's a little bit of that sort of like you're sacrificing yourself to me. Yeah, and you are you are de- debasing and degrading yourself to me. I am your god yeah yeah well it is a kind of a control thing i guess yeah you know um i mean it's the same way thing with the cenobites and the hellraiser movies well, it's like, pain and pleasure yeah and, and the <laughs> angels or demons it, it's all the same it's just all depending. the same it's all a yeah. perspective yep yeah but yeah i mean yeah that's one of the weirdest things i mean just straight up watching a guy get pissed on by by demon dick <laughs> yeah yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> wow, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, a couple of other things that are kind of cool, it's like, or kind of interesting. You know, I talked about it, it's like some of the characters are kind of interesting. Um, you know, it's like every character is unique. Uh, the, the, the guy, the, our main hero, played by David Dukes, he's, um, you know, his wife is kind of a nag. Yeah. Um, I mean, she's, she is problematic. Well, he's um, an intellectual. She's not. They don't feel like a great match. Well, and he's there to do business. She's bitching about being there. Yeah. And he's and he like reminds her, it's like, remember, this is work for this me. It's my job. Yeah. That's and how it's we like, put food on the table. Exactly. And like, uh, you also see that same idea with the kids. The son just wants to read his fucking comic books. And I, dude, I get it. Man. I understand, <laughs> man. Um, the the daughter is like you know like pestering him and they like, emulate their their gender exactly. almost yeah yeah and um you know and it's just their gender model yeah right because like right before the kid gets um uh gets taken and killed the son uh, they're they're in a car trip and they say um um. You know, it's like the, the the son's like, oh, I'm hungry. And, and the mom says, oh, you're a bottomless pit. And the daughter keeps asking, what's a bottomless pit? It's like, kid, there's there's only one answer to that question, and that is... The answer is itself. It's itself, right. It's like, I, there's no, I mean, 
kids, man. How do you, yeah, how do you describe a bottomless pit other yeah. than a pit with no bottom? <laughs> right, it's like exactly <laughs> as you said it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, there's a there's an instant, I mean, like, yes, the daughter is quite a bit younger, but still, there's a, there is an, that, that, that parallel that's run. And, um, you know, and it's like, it, it almost creates, like, additional strife and stress for the, you know, for the, for the husband that he, you know, not only does he have to deal with his job and a nagging wife and kids that fight with each other. And, uh, but he's also like in a foreign country, then he sees a monster that nobody believes what he saw. And then his son gets killed by that monster. By that monster yeah. yeah. And it's like, it's just, uh, you talk about like having a put upon character and then like the way they defeat rawhead rex is bizarre (laughs) because like so the whole point is is that rawhead rex was buried under that obelisk then there is a stone it was like a fertility stone of some sort because it looked like it had a vagina on the front of it and that was what was used to defeat him and you know so he tries to so like when rawhead rex gets to the church he discovers where that idol is and tries to um, <laughs> try, tries to defeat Rawhead Rex with it, but it doesn't work. But then randomly his wife shows up, picks up the stone, and it starts to work. Yeah. And because and then he's like, Oh, it's a woman. It had to be a woman to, right. to activate the power. Which is fine. You know, it's like that. Uh, yeah. I mean that that's interesting, uh, to a certain extent. But it's like she accidentally showed it. like hold, that dude hold, hold was the a phone a second did he kill any women in the movie no that's interesting yeah i didn't catch that until just now but a woman killed him but a woman killed him so that going back to the pregnant woman i mean maybe, maybe he's like some sort of fertility god or right. something yeah absolutely and he's yeah, because like the teenage daughter, you were sure because she says to I'm her boyfriend, sure. "I we have to talk about something." Yeah, you know, and her thick Irish bro. And I was almost positive <laughs> she was going to tell him that she was, she pregnant. was pregnant, and she and never did she, get a chance to tell him. No, she never because, said anything because he was way too much of a horn dog. Yeah, he was just trying to get trying to get his dick wet. He wanted to get her pregnant twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Once for good measure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he got killed by Rawhead Rags. Now, now, granted, she was running away, and the way he swiped in on them, but I, but you could say the that he would the trailer and everything, right? But, but it would not. No, he did kill a woman. He killed the topless woman. Oh yeah, he killed a bunch of people. Yeah, at the, he did. You're right. Was, but, that blows that. But he may have been. He may have still been a fertility creature of some sort because he didn't kill the woman that was pregnant that we knew was pregnant that th- he didn't kill the woman who we thought maybe was pregnant. Yeah. And he was defeated by a woman. Right. <sighs> That's the frustrating thing about this movie, right? Is that it's not even ambiguous enough to be interesting. Yeah. You kind of have to really grasp at straws to add the type of subtext that I would expect from Clive Barker. Cause Barker is all about subtext. Um, and I don't believe that George Pavlou is <laughs> about subtext. Right, no. And, and that it was a, is a, creates a very incongruent creative force. Yeah, uh, yeah, because it's like there, there were things that you could work with. Even with just a monster wakes up, rampages through town, there's still things you can make interesting about it. Yeah. You know, uh, like... Um, as bad as the mummy sequels were back in the forties, there was still an attempt to make something interesting about this monster shambling through a town. Um, as bad as some of the sixties Godzilla movies were, they gave him a personality. Yeah. You know, they, they tried to humanize and that makes it somewhat interesting. Um, you know, as bad as, nah, I'm not even going to say, I was going to say, as bad as the Transformers movies are, there's still something to look at. But that's, no, that's horseshit. They're bad. They're, they suck. So yeah, the point is, is that these are. We really liked the first one. 
Because it was a big, dumb action movie. It was big and dumb. And then they just made it bigger and dumber. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, anyway. Sorry. That's right. I broke your train of thought. No, you didn't. Because what I was saying was is that, I mean, there are piece, there's, something that, there's something there that is fascinating. Yeah. Um, but it, it got fumbled yeah. in the process. Yep. And so, I mean, but that doesn't, I mean, it's still, uh, I mean, I, it's still an enjoyable movie to watch. Sure. Um, so I find, I find it very fascinating. I mean, I, I find it fascinating, um, probably more because of the Barker angle. Yeah. Honestly, if this were just a one-off movie by a writer and director who never became came of anything then i don't know that i would find it as interesting as i as i find it now um it would have been those movies that we would have had the fond memories of just seeing on hbo on friday night you know um this i mean it still has that but it has a little bit more because it's like oh well it's clive barker you know it's like there's some ideas behind it there there's an effort to tell a story of some sort even though there really isn't a plot, there's a genesis. But there's a there, in it. Yeah, yeah, there is a there is a certain level of interest. Yep. Um, so I mean, yeah. Uh, so I mean, you got anything else you want to say about the I, movie? I don't know. I'm kind of. I think I'm pretty talked out on it. I I I want to say more about it. I think when we talk about Nightbreed. When we talk well, about I Hellraiser, we, I think when we get the full picture yeah. of everything around, because uh, aren't I mean, Clyde Barker in some ways is kind of like Stephen King, right? Where he tries to tie a lot a of a little his bit, property. yeah. I mean, it's well, and also you know that that I mean, that, there has been Hellraiser, um, uh, Lord of the Illusions crossover, yeah. in, in his writing now. Well, you know, and you talked is about Harry Dresden. Is that the yeah, yeah? So you talked about the. Um, um, you know the fact that you know one of the tropes that that Barker has is the uh, the easily swayed or the damaged character who can switch faith and stuff like. And King typically has a, an atheist hero sure. or something, you know. So it's yeah. almost like it's it's kind of touching upon the same. Yeah, and King, ideas. King is much about like a, a an underlying evil or or ambiguous evil that predates any concept of religion right right like there's a struggle that's been going on before we could define it right and the way that we define it in most cases is false Mm -hmm. which is what i really enjoyed about some of what we got in small kernels from i had rex is that look your church is probably bullshit it's a watered down version of of whatever rawhead rex signifies well it's 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 putting or represents uh, it, it's putting uh it's putting a smooth edge on something visceral well, well it's the berry thing right i mean mm-hmm. rawhead rex was buried deep in the ground well not so deep really but no it didn't seem like it not from a production <laughs> standpoint but no. it was supposed to be buried deep in the ground and i and there's a there's a metaphor there for for religion right and religion as it ages as it grows as it changes as another layer of dirt and erosion, you know, buries the old ways of thinking. These new ways of thinking kind of lose their real meaning. They come, yeah. they become something else. Like this is something that Neil Gaiman is also very, very um, interested in. And well, it's the idea of of the well, and you know, like uh, there, the there old is gods and the new gods. Exactly. There, yeah. I was just about to say the the DC comics concept of first world, second world, third world, fourth world. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the and that is a there. You know that was all Jack Kirby's creation, and that was born from the idea of ancient beliefs to the next, to the next, to the next. You know, uh, so so you get to the point where you you are representative of a religion that probably got its roots from this ancient demon in some way, shape, or form. Um, but you have, but you have no concept right. of that origin. Anymore. Well, it's it's kind of like uh, how much um, how much Christianity is uh, borrowed from Norse mythology. Yeah, uh, which is uh, the short answer is a ton, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, and it's uh, but but Christians today don't don't know about because that's now two thousand years past. Of you know, or almost two thousand years past of of that of that 
usurpation of, and of that changing. Yeah, and, and Christ, I mean, so many Christians today would probably crucify Christ. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. They would at least not vote for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, so yeah, it's 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 a perversion. Mm-hmm. And and that is what I find fascinating about Barker is is how Oh, the, we're going to see a lot of perversion. Yeah. <laughs> but his his ideas of of religion, of spirituality, of of the supernatural, of the afterlife. Um of the things we don't understand or the things that we think we understand through belief that aren't really based on what we think they're based on. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I think that that's, uh, that probably is a good way to, to kind of wrap up our, uh, our first of the, uh, of the Barker, uh, Barker, 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 Barker Mont- Bonanza, Barker Bonanza. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, the Barker Bonanza. Um, so out of uh, out of five decapitated raw heads. So are we, we going to do the decapitated raw head scoring system for all? No, just for Barker, just for raw heads. Just for just raw head Rex. Just how many raw heads do you want to give this um, raw well, head Rex character? I think we saw him with at least five raw heads. <laughs> Like I'm pretty sure he carried at least five raw, raw heads. Well, it seems like throughout it. this movie. Y- yeah. Um, but you know, I I think if I'm if I'm really being honest, it's probably just kind of a mediocre movie. Um, it's there's a lot of interest if you want to dissect it like kind of in the way that we have. Um, as a for a Barker fan, it's essential. I I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd agree for with the that. average viewer. Eh, give it like two, two, two raw heads, two to three mm-hmm. raw heads, two to three raw heads. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna be a little bit easier on. It. I'm gonna give it three and a half raw heads. Okay. Um, some of that is going to be nostalgia driven. Some of it's going to be, um, some you know, give, give it a raw head for, for, for Barker. Give it a raw head for Rawhead Rex, and give it a raw head for um, nostalgia, and give it a little half raw head for. Uh, for the characters, yeah, because you know, the characters are really well. I can buy that. Uh, you know, really well, uh, uh, well played and well crafted. Sure. Um, doesn't take much out of a script to uh, out of some from somebody like Clive Barker to create characters who are interesting. Uh-huh. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll give it three and a half raw heads. Okay. Give, give it like uh, you know, like like three full raw heads. And then the half would be like cut off under the nose, <laughs> so like just the goop so is coming out of the, the bottom. The goopy bore mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. So uh, no, I think uh, I mean I I think you're right. I think this is essential if you're if you're a Clyde Barker fan, and I think that this is a um, I think it's a good place to start because I think now we're kind of moving into his more uh, his more current and and better made movies a little more contemporary perhaps yeah Yeah. oh yeah i mean this is the rawhead rex is really kind of just a genre movie it's a bit of a throwback yeah yeah uh but we're we're gonna get into much deeper ideas as we move through but this is i think a good place to start and and yeah that's that's a great point to say because rawhead rex does feel like a throwback i don't think it ever feels truly contemporary probably even when it was released but a lot of his movies, like Hellraiser, like Candyman, um, those are the two that really spring to mind. Seem ever present. Yeah, they feel they feel like they always work. You know, in, in some ways, I wonder if Rawhead Rex was somewhat influenced by like the Hammer horror movies, where you have, you know, you have a, a religious idea, a religious villain. Um, you have a small town in a rural yeah. place, and yeah. there's a lot of um, the beast must scenery. Die. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I wonder if there's some of that that was that that played into, and it's like I'm just gonna make this is easy to write. This is yeah. easy to craft. Yeah. It's something I watched growing up. I don't think that he had a ton of expectations based on their nah. first collaboration. But he was like, it's it's worthwhile. It's a credit. Yeah. You know. Exactly. It's a credit. If it makes some money, then, you know, if, if it does anything, 
I can maybe sell this Hellraiser idea. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Exactly. Um, so, but no, I think this is a good place to, to stop. Um, yeah, this was a fun conversation. I, it really yeah. gets me excited for the for the rest of uh, the Barker Bonanza. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, we're not going to see anybody else get urinated right in their face. Um, but we're going to see some weird sex shit. Yeah, a lot of weird sex shit. Um, a lot of blood. A lot of blood, a lot of fluids. A lot of fluids. Uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of gay undertones yeah, in some, Lord of some, Illusion. Some homoeroticism yep. is, is in the mix. Yep. Uh, so um, yeah, so we've got we've got some more Barker ideas, some some uh, some uh, Barker banatical. But banat. <laughs> Banana, it's gonna be bananical. It's gonna be bananical. It's gonna be yeah. Bananas. Yeah, bananas. <laughs> Bonanza, bananas. Cool. Well, bananical. yeah. Join us next week, next Wednesday, uh, for the next uh, in our Barker a thon bonanza ish. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, definitely check that out. In the meantime, you can always uh, hit us up on the website at filmseizure dot com through uh, the social media networks. Um, you know. Facebook, Instagram, yeah, Twitter, and if you still actually tumblers. write emails, you can email us at filmseizure dot com or sorry, filmseizure uh, at gmail dot com. Gmail. <laughs> com. Yeah, you're 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 getting right to the chase. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but yeah, email us, send us suggestions, send us send us your thoughts, uh, have a conversation with us on social media. We yeah. we really would enjoy having that. Um, we we don't mind being told that we're totally stupid or wrong no no um, i take criticism rather well yeah me too and um and i think the beautiful thing about this podcast is we don't know everything we don't no. we don't we're I mean, coming in raw we could we're coming in raw head yeah <laughs> uh, we we could have probably read all of the short stories and and spent the last month preparing for barker bonanza by reading everything he's written but but that's not no. really what this is about this this is kind of about what our own approach right to these yeah. things and what we feel and what we, what we think. And I, we are understand that that's, um, that there's a lot more information and a lot more perspective, but we're also looking at these as films. We're yeah. not, I mean, or movie, well, film movies. Uh, we're, <laughs> I don't want to call anything a film quite yet. Video, a video. <laughs> we're looking at this as a VHS video movie. Sure. But we're no I mean, video the, home system. Yeah, home, video home system. We're we're looking at this like as just we want to watch these movies. We've seen these movies. We we know these movies. We love the guy whose mind these movies came from. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, we're we're just. I mean, we're. Uh, I mean, but we're just two assholes. Exactly. Yeah. Two assholes just and sitting here and drinking and we beer. And we don't mind saying it. So so if you yeah. have some input, some insights, some. Some beautiful nuggets. Let us know. We'd love to or hear you, it. Or if you want to call us something other than assholes. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm okay with being an asshole, yeah. but shithead works too, yeah. yeah. Shithead head. Sal. That could be the that could be the, the uh, garbage pail kid for Rawhead Reds. All right, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm Jeff Arbuckle. I'm Jason Oliver. And we will see you next week for the next Barker Bonanza movie Entry awesomeness. something, yes. Yes, have a good one. <laughs> Upstairs, fuck face.